Greetings once again. If you've been following along um, in the video lectures, we've been talking about what I like to call the IIU, industrialization, immigration, and urbanization. Um, all of these things are taking place in the late 19th century, and um, it's remaking uh, American life, as we'll see at the end of this video segment, but I need you to understand that all of these things are interrelated. Um, industrialization, which we've talked about, the, um, uh, the, the replacing of that household mode of production with uh, an industrial system, is leading to increased immigration, primarily because there are not enough American workers here in the United States at the turn of the century. Uh, to really fill those jobs uh, that 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 uh, unskilled labor is is so important for. Um, furthermore, as we'll again see here in just a minute, um, it's it's going to be in the cities, uh, Chicago, New York, uh, Los Angeles, Dallas, that you're going to see industry begin to cluster and concentrate itself. Um, for the time being, however, I, I want you to think about something. I want you to think about who or what is an American? What does an American look like? What does an American eat? How does an American dress? What language does an American speak? Um, to really illuminate this point, go ahead and download that, um, that uh, PowerPoint presentation entitled Immigration, Urbanization, and Industrialization. And on that second slide, you see that collage of various Americans. I mean, it doesn't take a historian to figure out that they're all American. Um, if you think about this, and if you think that, those of you that have taken History 1301, you'll understand that we are essentially a nation of immigrants. I mean, even Native Americans, um, more and more historical, uh, anthropological, um, archaeological evidence is suggesting that even Native Americans originally came from another part of the world. So I want you to put that back in your mind um, as we go through this segment and continue to ask yourself who or what is an American. Now let's talk about urbanization and let me get the definition out of the way for you very early on. Urbanization simply refers to a process of the development of cities. Okay, Cities are getting bigger in the middle and late 19th century in the United States and there's a very specific reason as to why. Um, the reason why is because industry was clustering there. Now, why is it that so many big industrial producers are concentrating themselves in a city like Chicago, for example? Well, actually, it's really pretty simple. Um, that's where the transportation networks are. If you think about where Chicago is located, it's located right there on Lake Michigan, so you've got a natural advantage when it comes to shipping. And it is also the railroad capital of the United States. I mean, basically all roads lead through Chicago. So you can ship your products much easier uh, from Chicago, so if you are located in Chicago, it's much cheaper when it comes to shipping costs. Now, in addition to being cheaper from a shipping perspective, it's also cheaper from a labor perspective. The cities are where more and more people live, and part of the reason for that is when people come to the United States, for instance, the main character of the jungle, Jurgis Rudkus, I mean, he really only knows one word in English, which is Chicago. And so when these immigrants are unloaded in places like New York or on the West Coast, San Francisco, they gravitate toward the cities. And anytime you have a high supply of workers, it's going to mean that the price that you pay for your labor is going to be relatively cheap. So the simple fact of the matter is, it's much cheaper to do business in Chicago if you're a steel manufacturing company, if you're a meat packing company, um, whatever it is that your company does, it, it's going to generally be cheaper to do it in Chicago than in the middle of nowhere, Virginia. Okay. Now this is also going to present the problem of urban sprawl, right? There's going to be a lot of clustering. Now throughout the 19th century. Cities were primarily referred to as walking cities because, for the most part, you could walk to any part of the city um, within about 20 minutes. I mean, think about it. Some of us have a hard time walking across campus in 20 minutes. So, therefore, you can understand how and why a big city like Dallas, uh, let alone a city like New York, would be so problematic. OK? 
okay? The simple fact of the matter is urbanization would not have been possible if we did not have improved technology, okay? Um, one of the biggest innovations at the turn of the century was the invention of electricity and the harnessing of electricity. Now, obviously, electricity turned night into day, and so people like Andrew Carnegie could keep those factories humming morning, noon, and night. There's that, but there's also the issue of transportation. There's a very famous baseball team that plays in um, Los Angeles, and I'm not referring to the Angels. Um, I'll never refer to the California Angels as the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, but nonetheless... I'd be talking about the Dodgers, and those of you that are avid baseball fans know that the Dodgers didn't originate in L.A., they actually originated in Brooklyn, and those of you that are really baseball connoisseurs will be able to tell me that they were originally called the Brooklyn Trolley Dodgers. The trolley was a brand new invention in the late 19th century, and it ran off electricity. And it was, it was, the reason that the Brooklyn Dodgers were called the Trolley Dodgers was because it was a brand new invention and people of that time period were so unused to having to look both ways before crossing the streets. There were some people that got ran over by trolleys. And as a matter of fact, it got so bad that there was once a point where the trolley companies uh, ended up installing like a, a little cot at the front of the train car and uh, somebody walked out in front of you it would scoop you up and flip you over on your back, and of course everybody would have a good laugh at your expense, but you didn't have train tracks coming up your forehead. So anyway, the trolley is responsible for getting you know millions of workers back and forth to work on a very timely basis and for relatively cheap. And without the trolley, or mass transportation generally speaking, industrialization and urbanization would have been impossible. The same thing is true of the skyscraper, okay? Skyscrapers, um, they're, they're very romanticized, but the simple fact of the matter is it's a form of technology that is allowing people to do more with less. There's only so much infrastructure that you can pack into a city like New York or even Chicago for that matter. And when the horizon is gone, in other words, you can only build out for so much time, and that's really relevant to a city like New York, which is essentially an island. Um, so you're going to have to make room using this space above you. Now, for those of you that have studied engineering or even construction, you'll be able to tell me there's only so far up you can go with concrete, which is what most of these buildings are made out of. The further up you go, the, the more top-heavy it gets and the more likely it is to crumble or to tip over. So all of these buildings would have been impossible had it not been for the invention and production of steel, right? It's not just a transcontinental railroad that Andrew Carnegie is producing for. It's also reinforcing these steel beams that are being used to build things like the Chrysler Building in New York. And so it's allowing engineers to use the, the, the space above the earth in order to put more people, more manufacturing, more infrastructure in small, tight places like the city of New York. Now, we should probably talk about what it was like to live in the city because we've got a very romanticized understanding of city life. I mean, Hollywood really paints it as glamorous and, you know, exciting and things of that sort. And, you know, to some extent it can be, but to some extent it's also very, very, very stressful. It was even more so at the turn of the century. The city life was overcrowded, it was polluted, and that's to say nothing of the poor quality of housing. I'll give you a really good for instance. In your big blue book, there is a piece entitled um, uh, How the Other Half Lives by a guy named Jacob Rees. And uh, what he points out is some extremely hazardous living conditions. For those of you that live in an apartment, you'll be able to tell me that that apartment is only licensed for, you know, four, five, six people. The smaller the apartment, the fewer people it's licensed for. Well, it's the fire department that essentially enforces these codes. You can only have six people in this apartment. Um, there is no code back in the late 19th century, and so therefore, not only entire families, but in, 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 in many instances, entire families would take on additional boarders, additional renters, in a one-bedroom apartment. So there really is no such thing as privacy. There's no such thing as adequate living space. Um, you're also generally talking about a time period 
before what you think of as indoor plumbing. Now there is indoor plumbing, but generally there's no bathroom in these one bedroom apartments. There's more or less a lavatory at the end of the hallway that's used by the entire community. So you can only imagine the kind of conditions these people lived in. You take that and you combine it with the fact that there are very, very few safety precautions taken with this housing. Um, for instance, you have some of these apartments that don't have a uh, window. They don't have any ventilation system. Um, they don't have fire escapes. So obvious, glaring, you know, fire hazards and safety concerns. Now, there are city officials that are trying to do something about it, but the problem is places like Chicago are growing faster than officials can keep up with it. And so the one exception to the rule might be Frederick Law Olmsted, who was an architect, and he was also the guy that designed uh, Central Park in New York. And Olmsted designed Central Park for New Yorkers, city dwellers, so that they would have a place to get back to what he felt was America's great roots, our great, rugged, pioneering roots, get back there and be able to get into the wilderness or sit next to a pond or breathe some fresh air. But outside of Central Park, I mean, really what you're talking about is a concrete jungle that was very, very difficult to live in. Now, the other thing that we need to talk about here is the process of immigration. I emphasize this is a process. Um, in the middle of the 19th century, wave after wave after wave of immigrants are hitting America's shores, and they're primarily coming from places like Ireland and Germany. The British Isles, too, but those are two of the big hot spots. Now, if you think back to history 1301, the Irish in particular were treated as second-class citizens. Over the course of time, they were absorbed by the, the, the dominant um, um, race, the dominant portions of society. And then in the late 19th century, you begin to see new immigrants coming, especially from southern and eastern Europe. I'm talking about people like Russians, Poles, um, Italians, uh, Slovakians, um, basically people from the southern and eastern portions of Europe. These people dress differently. They spoke different languages. They practiced different religions. They ate different foods. And in general, they did not exactly fit that prototypical image of American like uh, Abraham Lincoln did, uh, if you're looking at the PowerPoint. Um, now, we'll, we'll talk about various forms of discrimination that they faced here in just a few minutes, but for the time being, um, I want you to understand it's not as if we just flung open our doors and said, come one, come all. The processing point in the East for millions of what would become new Americans would be Ellis Island. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to New York, um, I'm going to assume that you're going to go have your picture made at the Statue of Liberty, and that's great, but what most people don't realize is that ferry ride from the Statue of Liberty also includes a trip out to Ellis Island. Go to Ellis Island. It's infinitely more interesting than Liberty Island. Ellis Island was the checkpoint for these people coming primarily from Europe, but all over the world, really. And it was the place that was processing these people before they just gained entrance into the United States. And so one of the first things that you had to do upon arrival at Ellis Island is register. And you stood in a massive long line where people were herded in from every corner of the globe, uh, much like cattle. And uh, when you got to the front of that line, um, this man that probably did not speak your native language uh, was asking you all these intimidating questions. What is your name? Do you have a job? Because we don't want you to become a public charge. Uh, do you have a place to stay? We don't want you to become homeless. Are you a socialist? Are you an anarchist? Are you a communist? Um, all these really intimidating questions, and the fact of the matter was, they're not speaking your language, and this came across as intimidating is putting it mildly. I would use the word traumatic. This is a very traumatic experience. To illuminate what I'm talking about here, put me on pause, and in the same folder that this video was located, you'll see another video, uh, which is a clip from a popular movie entitled The Godfather. Um, play that clip and, and talk to me a little bit about the experiences of Vito Corleone, right? Um, now, if you think about it, in addition to all these intimidating questions, he's also having to go through a physical examination. 
And you'll note that that was not uncommon at the time because in addition to political undesirables, we're also trying to sift out people that could infect the native-born population with all these subtropical diseases. And what happens to Vito is he's quarantined in uh, Ellis Island for several months. That was not uncommon. Now, what was relatively uncommon was sending people back. I, I want to say this, the statistic is over 80% of the people that came ultimately were admitted into the United States. But make no mistake about it, this is a very traumatic experience. Now, the other thing that I'd like you to be mindful of here is when they finally made it into life in the United States, they generally took the, the hardest, nastiest, meanest, and lowest paying jobs that America had to offer. And I make the case, it's not really all that novel of a case, but I'll make it nonetheless. Without these people, the in, life in the United States would be unrecognizable in the turn of the 20th century. There would be no such thing as industrialization, and we would not have become the power that we are today. Now, I don't care who you're talking about, whether you're talking about Italians, whether you're talking about Poles, whether you're talking about Russians, Jews, what have you, everybody goes through the assimilation process. And generally speaking, one of the ways that they assimilate is they hold on to something that is quite familiar to them, um, a job category, culture, religion, what, 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 what have you. And they use it to kind of immerse themselves into the broader society. So at this particular moment, um, it was really important to understand that the Italian immigrants consider themselves more Italian than they did American. Um, you could make the same case for the Jews, for the, the, the Russians. Uh, later on, you can certainly make the case for uh, the Chinese and Mexican uh, um, immigrants. But what I need you to understand here is part of the reason that they're holding on to uh, part of their old culture has everything to do with continuous wave after wave of immigrants hitting the American shores well into the 20th century. It's not going to be until the 1920s that you're going to see second and third generation immigrants really beginning to become part of what historians will call the mass culture. Okay. Now, I also want to point out that not everybody was real excited to see these newcomers arriving in America. We've talked about the word xenophobia before, but I want to make sure you're very clear on this. Xenophobia simply refers to you know, a fear of foreigners, a fear of people that are different. And xenophobia was running rampant in the late 19th century. There were all kinds of people that opposed uh, the process of immigration. They didn't want to see more immigrants coming. As a matter of fact, what they wanted to see is the American government shut off immigration altogether. Uh, you had working class organizations that said they're going to drag down wages and deteriorate already pretty bad working conditions. But you also had eugenics um, and eugenicists. Uh, eugenics was a pseudoscience, uh, a false science that was sweeping across the Western world at the time, and it emphasized that there was a hierarchy to mankind. And quite, quite predictable that, that that hierarchy started with people of northern and western European descent, uh, Britain, Germany, Scandinavia, France, and kind of trickled down thereafter. So the darker races uh, would have been at the bottom of that pyramid, so to speak. Now, this essentially is the basis of what later would become known as Aryan supremacy in the Third Reich of, of Nazi Germany, but it's being, it's being practiced and discussed mightily in academic circles here in the United States. And so what people like F. Prescott Hall, who was a really instrumental force in the foundation of what would later become known as the Immigration Restriction League, um, what he argued was these people should be barred from the United States, not necessarily because they're going to take these jobs away from quote-unquote real Americans, but primarily because they're going to do things like intermarry with the native-born population. And what that's going to do, according to eugenics um, um, philosophers like Hall, is deteriorate this quote-unquote great Anglo-American stock that was apparently to these individuals what made America a great place to begin with. 
So I need you to understand, these people were discriminated against. These people were looked down upon. These people were not considered white. I mean, Jurgis Rutkus is a really good example. He would not have been considered a white man um, in the same way that he would have in the 20th, 21st century context. Um, these people, for all intents and purposes, were treated as second-class citizens. Now think about this in the context of the jungle. There are very few individuals that are willing to go to bat for people like Jurgis Rudkus. The, and I mean this from a political standpoint, the, the one really big, big exception would be political machines. Now, before we go any further, I want to be really clear about what I mean as far as political machines. This is not an engine or anything like that. It's simply a relationship. It's a relationship where you, the voter, trade me, the politician, your vote. You give me your vote, and I give you some sort of political favor. So if you need a job, maybe I find a job for you somewhere in the city government. If you want to sell fruit as a, at your uh, push cart stand in the middle of Chicago, you'll need a license to do that, and of course I'll help you get that license. If grandma needs a place to stay and you just simply can't find a place for her, I'll find a place for her to stay. Now, in addition to me helping you, it's expected that you help me get elected. Not just you vote, but your brother votes for me and your uncle and your friends and your neighbors and your buddies all down at work. They all vote for me as well. These politicians were referred to as political bosses. And while some of you are saying this is not exactly a healthy exchange of democracy, let me ask you. Who else is standing up for immigrants in the late 19th century? I mean, the political bosses and their political machines were really the only advocate that many of these immigrants had in the late 19th century, considering it's the corporations and the special interests that are really running Washington, running the federal government, and they're less than concerned about things like working conditions or hazardous living arrangements or things of that sort, okay? So on the one hand, yes, it is it's completely corrupt, but it's really the only thing that the immigrants have going for them uh, from a political standpoint in the late 19th century. With our last segment, I want to talk about how these immigrants are changing American culture. Now, make no mistake about it, they are changing American culture. They're changing the look of America, they're changing the demographics where people live in America, and most importantly, they're changing what people do for a pastime. Now, to help you understand this, um, I want to talk to you about um, uh, 1892 in what would become known as the White City of Chicago. 1892 was the Columbian Exposition, and it was the 400th anniversary of Columbus's quote-unquote discovery of America. And there were a lot of people that wanted to honor this um, event, and Chicago hosted it. And they hired uh, our good friend Frederick Law Olmsted to create something called the White City. Now, what the White City was, was a glorification of Western culture and Western achievements. So it had all of this ancient Greco-Roman architecture on display, fine works of art, uh, sculptures, photographs, you name it, right? Over the course of time, what Olmsted noticed was a lot of people got really bored with this, and they left which was the last thing that Olmsted wanted. So to keep them interested and to keep them there, he created something called the Midway, which I like to think of as a carnival sideshow. It had things like a Ferris wheel. It had, uh, you know, people that would breathe fire or, you know, all these things that human beings are fascinated with. And it worked like wonders, and it worked so well that it convinced this New York businessman, a guy by the name of George C. Tillieu, that... Dangerous pastimes or taboo pastimes could be marketed and Americans would pay big money to do something out of the ordinary. George Tillieu is the New York businessman that essentially gives us what comes to be known as Coney Island, America's first amusement park. Okay, Now, Coney Island um, capitalized on two things. It capitalized on the fact that men and women of working class variety now had specific work rhythms you got on the job at 9, you got off the job at 5. This replaces the sun-up, sun-down work regimes of the middle 19th century where most people would have described themselves as farmers. The other thing that he capitalizes on is the fact that the monotonous work regime, uh, tightening bolts all day, cutting metal all day, really wore people down. And when the end of the week rolled around, what they wanted was something way more interesting than, uh, maybe interesting is a bad way of putting it, but dangerous 
than examining a Picasso painting or a, probably in this per particular period um, uh, uh, something like a Leonardo da Vinci uh, um, uh, painting. Right? So anyway, um, till you markets these uh, uh, dangerous leisure pastimes. When I say dangerous, I, I don't necessarily mean like something illegal or anything like that. I'm just talking about things that were frowned upon by Victorian era culture. All right? One of those things was the beaches. Now you think about the kind of clothes that you wear to the beach. Um, it's not a lot of clothes, right? Well, back during this time period, wearing something, you know, like a bathing suit would get you arrested until you understood that people would pay to have a pastime that was kind of dangerous in the sense that what you're really doing is breaking the law. So one of the things that Ellis Island had a lot of was beaches and people were encouraged to come and you know try out their new bathing suits and things of that sort. He also kind of marketed the idea of a roller coaster. Now, if, for those of you that like to ride roller coasters, what makes roller coasters fun is not the fact that they go fast. I mean, if you're going to go into Six Flags, um, you're, you're generally moving faster on I-20 on the way in. Uh, what makes it fast is the adrenaline rush, right? So anyway, um, we had had the technology through miners, uh, people going down these mine shafts for, you know, several years. All Till you did was take that same concept and market it to leisure. Um, but other things like, you know, the Tunnel of Love, um, it, it was one of the biggest taboos in, in, in Gilded Age society, the mixing of the sexes. I mean, anything could happen. That, that was not a good thing as far as this older generation was concerned. But generally speaking, what I'd like you to understand about Coney Island is it's very reflective of this changing ethnic demographics in American life. And had it not been for all these immigrants coming over with different ideas in terms of what downtime, leisure time consisted of, is a very good possibility that Till you wouldn't have had a market to sell his services to. But nonetheless, um, I'm hopeful that you can understand not only how industrialization encourages things like urbanization and immigration, I'm also hopeful that you can understand how and why this is really changing America and sending us in a new direction from a cultural standpoint, from a political standpoint. And so when we come back, um, we'll be talking about the development of um, the industrial economy outside the traditional setting of the, uh, the urban Midwest or the Northeast. Uh, we're we're going to be generally focusing on the area west of the Mississippi River. But for right now, that's where I'll leave it.